Why would an Ivy League trained scientist from a non-religious family come to faith in God? What were the big questions he had to overcome? And how has this newfound faith transformed his life? Our guest today, Dr. Tom Rudelius, is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Berkeley, specializing in theoretical physics. He studied at Harvard, Princeton, and Cornell universities and is the author of a fascinating book I thoroughly enjoyed and want to commend my viewers called Chasing Proof, Finding Faith. Dr. Rudelius, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, Sean. Well, let's dive right into your story. You described growing up in a largely non-religious family and didn't think about God much. So maybe tell us, what was your family like? And if I had asked you before your conversion in college what you thought about God, what might you have said? Yeah, so as you said, my family growing up was very non-religious. Um, went to church maybe two or three times my my entire childhood. Wow. Um, that said, my family w was really loving. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm so mm -hmm. thankful for my parents, how they raised me. And uh, was yeah, I was just very close with them, with my twin brother, Steve. And, mm -hmm. uh, and even extended family, like aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, uh, just a very tight knit, uh, family. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that was my family growing up. Uh, as far as what I, what I thought about God, you know, I, I guess, I guess if I had to put a word on it, I would probably say agnostic, but the truth okay. is that I just re really didn't care all that much. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I guess in my, in my mind, uh, in my framework, religion was, the goal of religion was mainly to just help people live happy lives and to be moral people. And mm -hmm. I figured, hey, you know, I have a pretty happy life and I'm a pretty moral person. So re religion just didn't see, seem like something I needed. Did you think at all about who Jesus was? Did you think about life after death or you were just so focused on your career that it just didn't really even concern you? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it was like hmm. school and sports were the two things that I was really into growing up. And, um, and so, yeah, just the, those seemed more interesting and more important to me than the question of like, who is Jesus and what is life after death? It, it seemed as far as the afterlife goes, I guess I kind of figured like, well, if there's a heaven, I'll probably go to it. You know, I'm a, mm. I'm a, I'm a good person. And that, that was enough for most of my childhood. Now, you mentioned your twin brother, Steve, and he comes out very quickly in your book as being a key part of the story where you're a college student, he has a kind of surprising spiritual awakening. So maybe tell us what happened in his life and how this started to affect you. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess to tell his story, I need to kind of maybe go back to like high school uh, okay. age. And, and at that time, as I said, I was pretty agnostic, didn't really seem to care much about religion. My twin brother, Steve, if anything, was probably a little bit more hostile towards religion oh. than I was. Um, and yet... So, so during his the summer after his senior year of high school, um, he all of a sudden started having these obsessive thoughts about death. Like he just realized mm -hmm. one day I'm going to die and that's going to be, be the end of me. Wow. And and he didn't he definitely he didn't tell me about this at the time, but mm -hmm. it was something that just kind of ate him up inside for the entire summer. Um, mm -hmm. And he looked into different religions, you know, different worldviews on what, what they believed about the afterlife, and ultimately found that all of them were pretty unsatisfying. But in the midst of that, and, and kind of these, these obsessive thoughts about death, um, we went off to college, I went to Cornell, he went to Northwestern. And his freshman year, he met a guy on his floor named Matt, who was probably like the first really serious, uh, thinking, outspoken Christian okay. that either of us had ever met. Huh. Um, and so... Um, Steve, you know, Steve wasn't immediately convinced by all that Matt had to say about God and Jesus and, and all of this, but, um, but he, he was intrigued by the idea that someone who was intelligent, like Matt could actually believe it in an afterlife, right? That he could actually believe that there's something more to this world than what meets the eye. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was something that given Steve's obsessive thoughts that he'd been having about death it kind of he kind of met matt at just the right time okay and he started talking steve started reading the bible uh he started going to church with matt and to make a long story short he ultimately decided to become a christian hmm. yeah. okay so he becomes a christian 
How does he yeah. break this to you? Like, did you know he was on this journey or is it like, bam, he just dropped a bomb on you? Yeah, I mean, I knew that he'd kind of been like looking into um, re- religion, but uh, but when he he told me that he had become a Christian, it, it was kind of just like dropping the bomb on me. Like, I was mm. like, whoa, what? Like, it, it was just very surprising, as I say, of the two of us. He was probably more antagonistic towards religious faith growing up. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I was, so I was just very surprised. And most of all, I was just kind of worried that Mm. I was going to lose my twin brother, best friend. I just didn't know where this path would take him, but I was kind of afraid of the unknown. That's really interesting. Important for people to hear that as I'm a Christian, I get excited that someone comes to faith, but that's obviously not everybody's response. And some of that response is legitimate because how they've seen maybe Christians live out their faith. So how did this affect you? Did it make you think, I wonder if he's onto something? Did you separate yourself from him? Walk through how that shaped you and your journey to become a Christian. Yeah, so I, um, I it was kind of, yeah, it, I definitely didn't kind of separate myself from mm. it. it. It was it was kind of the opposite where, you know, my, my twin brother had, had, had always been and still is my best friend. Mm. And so I kind of didn't want to, to like lose him to this. So, um, so there was kind of this curiosity of just wanting to know, like, what is this, this thing called religion that he's, he's stumbled upon this, this Christian faith. And, um, and so he, I mean, he was pretty like, um, I don't know, evangelistic, I guess, t- towards okay. me. Like, he pretty immediately started trying to convert me okay. and, um, <laughs> and because I was curious, because I didn't want to lose him. I was kind of willing to to go down that path and to see what you know what is this all about. So when we were both home after our first freshman year of college, I started going to church with him, mm. and and it wasn't like you know that I was just dying to have these questions about the meaning of life answered. It, it was really just like, well, if he's going to church, you know, I I just want to stay with him, you know, and, and mm. check it. I'll check it out too. That's fascinating. Now, w- one of the things that you talk about is that you had a lot of objections before you came to belief in God. And I love how this book is kind of telling your story and you weave those objections through it. It makes it super interesting and relevant. It's really well written. But one of the big objections, it actually wasn't a big objection, was belief in God. And some of this might be your background in science and in physics. You kind of described that wasn't a big barrier and maybe fine tuning had a piece to do with that. So tell me from kind of agnostic to just generally believing in God, what that jump was like. Yeah. um, Yeah. I mean, I think the, the fine tuning, as you mentioned, was, was kind of a, one of the first arguments that got me thinking that the existence of God, God was plausible. Um, Hmm. I think that something else that um, really appealed to me as a scientist uh, about Christianity in particular um, was the fact that the Christianity is based on a, on the truth of a historical person and an, and a historical mm. event, right? Like, um, I mean, there, there are other faiths out there, right? Um, I think, I think Buddhism probably falls into this category where it's like, if, if Buddha never existed, most of the, Buddhist faith would could continue on just as it was, right? Like yep. I'm I'm sure that there would be some, you know, modifications here or there, but a lot of the the principles, the philosophies, the meditation, um, all of those things could continue on w- without Buddha. Uh, but with Jesus, right? If if you take away the resurrection, um, to me at least, the, the Christian faith just like loses all its teeth. You know, I I wouldn't mm-hmm. want any part of that religion if, if, you know, if, if Jesus isn't risen from the dead. And so to me, that was something that appealed to me as well, that Christianity had more of a, like a testable, falsifiable basis for its truth claims that I could actually investigate the historicity of Jesus and his miracles and his resurrection uh, from the framework of, of like a scientist investigating any sort of truth claim. I thought that piece of your book was really interesting because my colleague and actually my boss where I teach at Biola in our apologetics master's program who founded it has written a book on like five reasons why a spiritual quest should begin with Christianity. And Mm -hmm. one of his reasons is that it invites investigation. In Houston Smith's World Religions, 
uh, there's a quote that says if attributed to Buddha it says if anybody does a miracle that person is not a follower of mine Buddha allegedly mm. said that Jesus grounds the entire Christian faith in a single testable historical event so even if somebody ends up concluding it's false I loved seeing that your scientific mind was like, wait a minute, you can investigate this. These are public claims. I want to see if the evidence stacks up and you start to look at it. Now, we're going to get into some of your conclusions about Jesus. And I thought some of your uh, some of your thoughts on just reading the New Testament, even before you were a Christian, yeah. were so interesting to me. But first, one of the barriers you had was this idea of miracles so the moment you dive into a bible right. it's yeah. obvious there's miracles and yet you described in your mindset kind of like in the world of physics kind of these inviolable laws that cannot be broken so how did you overcome this idea that miracles seem to violate the laws of science yeah yeah it, as you say it was one of the things that bothered me most of all when i first started hmm. exploring because i, I you know i Growing up with this mindset of like you know science is great and um, and like there are these immutable laws of nature and miracles seemed like they kind of went went against that um, and as I look back now I I almost think it's it's kind of that frame that mindset of mine was kind of silly because today yeah. I mean I still think that science is great but I think that science is not in the business of telling us whether or not supernatural intervention is possible mm. in the first place right? it tells us. It tells us how the world works in the absence of supernatural intervention, but it doesn't really tell us if, if such intervention is possible in the first place. Um, I think, too, I've uh, something that has kind of changed how I think about miracles, especially the miracles of Jesus. You know, from, from an atheistic perspective, I think the miracles of Jesus are, are hard to swallow because they represent like a breakdown of the laws of nature, a breakdown mm. of the way that the world is supposed to be. But um, to Jesus, actually, his miracles weren't a breakdown of the way that the world is supposed to be, but actually a restoration of the world to the way that it's supposed mm. to be. Right? The world isn't supposed to have evil, and so Jesus casts out demons. It's not supposed to have this disease, and so Jesus heals the sick. And it's not supposed to have death, so Jesus raises the dead and ultimately mm. conquers death through his resurrection. So I think that was the big thing is that, um, you know, as I look back, I think that my rejection of miracles was kind of, it was based on this impl implicitly kind of assuming an atheistic worldview. And from that mm. worldview, yes, miracles really don't make any sense. Um, but once I started to open my eyes and my mind to the possibility of a Christian worldview, then the miracles not only, I think, are possible, but actually really make sense in light of the larger story of what God was doing through Jesus. I teach a class in our program on the resurrection. We walk through the evidence for miracles, Hume's challenges against it. And when I read this in your book, I'm like, that's the heart of it. If we know that God doesn't exist, then miracles yeah. are not possible. But if yeah. God yeah. even possibly exists, then miracles are possible. So unless we know definitively there's no God, we can't begin an investigation in the miraculous assuming they don't happen. That's not a very scientific right. way to look at the world. Let's at least be open to it. Right. So yeah. I think I think that's a huge piece, and I appreciate that you you unpack that a little bit. Mm. Um, all right. So what was also interesting to me is you describe kind of being captivated by this person Jesus when you read the Gospels. So you're not a Christian yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe tell us a little bit about what was your mindset in reading them. Were you looking for truth? Were you just looking for a good story? Were you appeasing your brother like, fine, I'll just read it because you're a Christian? So tell us your mindset going into it. And then maybe one or two of the things that stood out to you about this person, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. So I think my mindset going into it, I, th I think it was pretty close to the last one you mentioned of, of appeasing my twin brother. Um, a little bit of <laughs> okay. appeasing him, a little bit of you know, like curiosity to, to learn okay. about this religion that he's, um, that he's all of a sudden committed his life to. And something going into it, um, you know, I, I, growing up, I had a number of friends who uh, you know, in in middle school and high school who would go to church every Sunday because their parents made them. And and the thing that I always heard from them was that, you know, church is really boring. The Bible is really boring. And and that's what I expected to find. Um, but when I actually started reading the New Testament, like uh, Steve, Steve gave me a copy of the of just the New Testament. And I started reading Matthew. And um, I actually found that it was really interesting. Like I had I had planned to try to read one chapter a day. Uh, but when I got near the end of the of one of the Gospels, there were times where I, I was so captivated that I would read three or four chapters. Mm. And 
and I think something that really stood out to me about Jesus, um, and, and something that still stands out to me about Jesus, is just the way that he um, he identified with and he stood up for the the poor and the marginalized and the oppressed. And that was something that, um, yeah, I mean, it really just kind of stood out to me that reading this and and reflecting on the fact that this is one of, if not the most famous and, and important people that have, have ever lived, that you, you compare Jesus to so many other important people who have rose to prominence through political power or military might. And, and yet Jesus, somehow, he's acquired all this fame, not through those things, but rather just through self-sacrificial love, through, mm. through loving and standing up for the people that, that no one else would love or st- stand up for. Mm. Um, and so that was something that really just, yeah, ca- captivated me um, and impressed me about Jesus. Now, you made this contrast, and you said it didn't quite convict you, but you described your treatment of a friend maybe back in high school who was a little bit more marginalized, and you didn't want to reach out to this person because what it cost you, comparing that with Jesus, what was that contrast? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I thought of a couple of examples throughout my childhood where I was in classes with students who were kind of more socially awkward, kind of like teacher's pets. And, uh, and, you know, most of the class would kind of like ridicule these people. Hmm. Um, and, and like, as I thought, looked back at my own life, I, I, it's like, man, I always just kind of joined in the crowd. You know, I would always just kind of, um, make fun of these people and, and not hmm. befriend them. And, um, and that was something that, yeah, reading about how Jesus, um, Jesus, you know, handled and, and how he interacted with people that were um, on the fringes of society. It, it was really just a, a very stark contrast. Hmm. And I guess it made me start to think, you know, um, even if even if this isn't God, I would hope that God is like this. Wow. That's, that's a powerful thought. Uh, I love that. So it's like these seeds are kind of being planted in your heart, slowly shifting your worldview a little bit. Yeah. Now, embedded through this book was a whole kind of story I didn't expect about you applying for national security yes. clearance and this whole drama you went through and how it affected you. So you wanted to work for the NSA. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about kind of your desire to do that and then how taking this polygraph kind of rocked yeah. your world. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I'd grown up watching like the like James Bond movies and Jason of course. Bond movies <laughs> and uh, – and so I, you know, had this like dream of working in the intelligence community. Um, I would have, I would have not, uh, as I think I wrote in the book, my my job would involve far far fewer guns and beautiful women and a lot more math. <laughs> uh, but it was still, you know, kind of a fun thing to to try to do. So yeah, so I got a conditional offer. I had to complete a background investigation and a polygraph to get this um, top secret security clearance. And I went in, and I think my my feeling towards the polygraph was actually pretty similar to uh, to my feelings towards heaven, um, which is, you know, I haven't done anything seriously wrong in my life. Uh, you know, I should be fine, right? Like, if there's a heaven, I'll probably go to it. And here, uh, like, I'll probably pass this polygraph, right? Because they're trying to they're trying to find like terrorists or spies, like Russian <laughs> sure. spies, right? And I'm and I'm just a normal kid, and I haven't done anything seriously wrong. I'm a good guy, so it'll be fine. Um, but I went in, fired up the test, and I realized pretty quickly that I was going to fail uh, not only if I were lying, but just if I felt guilty about anything. Hmm. So for about four hours, I had to share everything that I could think of that I'd done wrong in my life. And um, and this is kind of right in the midst of this of all these conversations I was having with my twin brother and uh, reading the Bible, reading some other books about Christianity. And kind of the big hang up, as I, I can say, looking back for me on Christianity was it still just didn't feel like the th- sort of thing that I needed because, you know, I feel like I'm basically a good person. And, um, and it was in that polygraph room that really the first half of the gospel message that, that I, like all people, a- am sinful, that I'm in need of forgiveness, mm-hmm. that that started to make sense. And when that made sense, the second half of the gospel, that there's a God who loves me, who's forgiven me through the death of Jesus, that really made sense as well. Um, like all of a sudden I realized that I, I needed that. And, uh, and all of a sudden Christianity just made better sense out of my life and out of my experience than the worldview that I was leaving behind. 
So is it fair to say that's where it shifted from your head in a sense to your heart, where it went from mind to your experience and you had that moment of like, whoa, am I a sinner? I need a savior in a sense. Yeah, yeah, I think definitely. Because, hmm. you know, by that point I had been, you know, I'd been discussing with Steve, I'd been learning about Christianity. Intellectually it was seeming more more and more plausible. Um, but there was still just kind of, yeah, the heart level thing of, uh, you know, just like, I don't know, stubbornly resisting God, I guess, where hmm. even though I could intellectually, it was like, man, this, this stuff actually seems to make sense. There was kind of still just this, yeah, resistance to actually hmm. devoting my life to God. Um, and that's where, yeah, that resistance kind of broke. And I realized, hey, you know, like this isn't just for the people who look really bad on the surface, like I, I too, uh, you know, deep down, I'm not as good as, of a person as I'd like to think I am. Mm. I grew up in a Christian home uh, with a father with a pretty dramatic story to faith that involved evidences and searching things out. And he remembers like having this moment, I think it was six o'clock in a library in London thinking, oh my goodness, it's true. I have a season where it came true to me, but not this general like, you know, wow moment it seems like you had kind of a moment where you are like, oh my goodness, I am a Christian. I actually believe this. What was that moment? And what was it like when you told your brother? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was really, uh, it was really like a joyful and freeing moment. And hmm. I, I think that's, a, I, I didn't realize how surprising that was at the time, but as I look back, it's kind of like, man, you know, I just had to, had this terrible experience of having to confess for four hours, all the worst things I'd ever done. And um, and realizing, like, I'm not actually as good of a person as I like to think I am. And you might have thought that that realization would just, like, be, like, crushing hmm. or, like, very shameful. But actually, it was somehow just very freeing, like, realizing that this is exactly the sort of stuff that, that Jesus died for. You know, that, that, that Christianity offers this solution to exactly the problem I have right now of hmm. my own sin and my own guilt and my own shame. Um, so, yeah, it was just a really... Um, joyful experience uh just feeling like i was just like on top of the world for the next few days mm. and and so yeah i wrote my brother um uh, uh about uh, uh maybe two or three days later uh, that i had come to faith um and he was really just overjoyed and so he, wait, 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 hey, hang know, on a minute you wrote yeah. him like a hand letter a text why didn't you I, call him so I he could hear your a, voice i sent him a facebook <laughs> message uh which okay. really kind of dates Right. Uh, like, I don't know how many how many of the kids, <laughs> in, the college kids are sending Facebook messages anymore. But yeah, I sent, okay. him, I sent him a Facebook message. I think it was like 1 a.m. or something. And I have no idea why I was up that late. Uh, but it was like, mm -hmm. yeah, 1 or one thirty a.m. I sent him a Facebook message telling him that I think, you know, that I've um, that I've become a Christian, basically. And uh, and so, yeah, he was he was overjoyed. He called me up the, the, ne mm -hmm. the next day when he saw it. And um and he asked me, like, uh, so would you say that you're ready to put your faith in Jesus? Uh, and it was, I actually almost said no, because it, I, I don't know. It was like hearing it, I was like, man, I don't know if I'm ready to go that far. But then there was kind of the thought mm. of like, well, if, if not now, then when? Right. Like if this isn't mm. if this isn't God reaching out and and kind of like revealing himself to me in a sense, um, then then what is? And so. Mm. Um, so yeah, so we prayed together, uh, and I, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's to me, I guess the moment when, when things changed. I love that you're able to share that with your brother. Did, did I read right that from him telling you he was a Christian and you becoming a Christian was about eight, eight months, this whole journey was? That sounds about right, yeah. Okay, now I imagine there's some people that are watching this going, okay, so you had little questions about the existence of God, solve that quickly, read the New Testament, believe in Jesus. Like for a first-rate intellectual with Ivy League training like yourself, this feels too easy. Now you do walk through in the book some of the other objections, and I think it'd be helpful if I could just ask you some of these and how you resolved them. And some of them were before you became a Christian, and some of them really hit you hard after you became a Christian. That's right. So yeah. let's walk through some of these. One, you described taking this class on New Testament uh, introduction, and it was yeah. with Bart Ehrman, obviously one of the most well-known kind of skeptics today, and his beliefs aside, obviously a brilliant uh, scholar in his own right. 
you didn't find, people warned you not to watch this, but you ended up not finding some of his critiques very convincing. Why not? Yeah. So, um, so as you said, yeah, I took this class. It was, it was using his textbook, Bart Ehrman's textbook, um, mm. introduction to the New Testament. And the, the professor was actually a former grad student of his. So okay. it was very much steeped in like Ehrman tradition. Uh, yeah. And I guess, yeah, as you said, it, it kind of, it really didn't have that much of effect on me, even though some people kind of warned me not to, not to take it. The, I think that there was kind of maybe two classes of objections that were raised in that class. Um, one of them, were there, you know, there were these kind of his, historical issues raised about, uh, you know, who, who, who actually wrote the, the New Testament documents, right? Because we can't trust the, the, that they're actually written by the people they're attributed to um, and things like this. And I guess for me at the time, I, I never felt like I really had a great answer to those objections because it's like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just like a sophomore in college, right? I've, I'm, hmm. I'm not an expert on this stuff and I'm certainly not going to be able to address every single thing that, hmm. that Ehrman is going to tell me. Uh, I think it, it was helpful to know that there were other scholars who who disagreed, right? That I, I I knew enough to know reading this textbook that it's like, okay, well he says this, but actually I know that this is a controversial point that a lot that there's a lot of disagreement on within the scholarly communities. Um, but I also kind of just had this realization that I, I couldn't base my faith on being able to an answer every single one of these objections. Hmm. That um, you know, to me, what was important was my the experience of God and the resurrection of Jesus. And as long mm. as I had those two things, then all of these other things, while, while important in a sense, th they were also kind of more peripheral. That I, di you know, I didn't need to, to die on the hill of who wrote Colossians, uh, <laughs> that I could, I could kind of come back to that question later and, and still follow Jesus based on what I had experienced and based on his resurrection. And, th and that was another thing that I really noticed is, you know, er Ehrman had a lot to say about lots of, of parts in the New Testament, you know, lots of parts uh, and questioning a lot of parts. But I noticed that when it came to the resurrection, he, he never really made a historical argument against it. Um, hmm. But instead, he just made a philosophical argument, which was this kind of Humean uh, miracles are necessarily the most improbable of events. Therefore, we can never say that they probably happened. Um, and as I said before, you know, to me, there was kind of this realization, well, it's like, okay, that's true if atheism is true. If atheism is true, then I agree that miracles are incredibly improbable. But if Christianity is true, if theism is true, and, and if God really, if Jesus really is God's son, uh, then wouldn't I expect to, to maybe see some miracles here? And, and so that to me, I guess I just didn't, um, I didn't find his philosophical argument convincing. And I thought it was somewhat noteworthy that, you know, as a historian, hmm. that that he wasn't giving a lot of historical arguments against the resurrection. Um, he was kind of rich, what to me felt like a bit of a retreat to this more philosophical position that I didn't agree with. So as a result of that, I think that my, you know, I think that the class was helpful in teaching me a lot about the New Testament and Good. also kind of shaping my priorities of, you know, what are the things that are, what are the hills that I really want to die on? But it really didn't do. Uh, it really didn't affect my belief in God hmm. or in Jesus, because if anything, it I think if anything, I think it actually strengthened my belief in the resurrection. Some of the challenges that Ehrman has raised are about contradictions or alleged contradictions in the Bible and the New Testament. And one of my responses, I think, if we go to context and the culture and language, there's very plausible ways to make sense of these discrepancies. But I'll say to students, I'll say, even if there is a contradiction, I would not abandon my faith. I, it raises questions about, you know, did we get the right books of the Bible? Or did we, you know, what does it mean that the Bible is the inspired word of God isn't inerrant? Those are very important questions. Yeah. But they're secondary to the central question of Jesus rising from the grave. And we can know that even if there were an errant Bible. So... That's not to concede that I think all those things are true, but I think the in your mind, it's amazing you thought this way because a lot of people don't. Like, I'm going to take an objection and ask how central is this and how much does my faith rest upon this objection? 
I think the way you parse that at that stage in your life was exactly the way I would encourage somebody to do so. And that's one example of a lot of the kind of wisdom that comes through in your book that I, I really enjoy. Let me ask you another one. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also talk a good amount about some of the Old Testament violence really bothering you, whether it's slavery, yeah. whether it's genocide, these bizarre passages. How did that affect you and how did you resolve some of those challenges? Yeah, I think that that's kind of been a, a more um, like persistent uh, hmm. doubt, I guess that you'll, you could say that I've had. That I, I still feel like today, e- even that I, I don't have like a fully convincing um, re- response to that. You know that that yeah, some of the stuff in the Old Testament. I mean, first of all, so, a lot of stuff in the Old Testament I, I think is just really beautiful. You know, I love I love the Amen. way that it kind of weaves together. I love the way that. Um, these, you, you see like these echoes of Jesus, uh, and these echoes of God's grace and forgiveness all the way back in the old Testament. But yeah, I'm not like, I'm not going to lie. You know, there's some stuff in there that has really bothered me and, and still really bothers me. Um, I think that, you know, it, um, I think that the, where I've kind of settled at a place of, um, of relative, you know, being, being able to make peace with it. Uh, has been just to look at Jesus and and to see hmm. how um, how the old te- so much of the Old Testament I, I think kind of points to him and and how he in some ways even even resolves some of the issues and 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 doubts that I have. So like for instance, um, one thing that is kind of strange, confusing is when uh, is God calling. Abraham to sacrifice his son, son Isaac, right? And and that looks pretty like messed up, first of all, if he goes through with it, but at least kind of weird. And I mean, agreed. Yeah, like it's a strange passage, right? Um, but I think that there's something beautiful in in being able to to look at Jesus and to say that in in him actually God went through with that sacrifice, right? That God actually gave up his own son uh, so that we could have life. And so I think that there's, yeah, there's a number of cases like that where it's like, you know, I don't know if that completely resolves all of the, like, the, the um, doubt that I have, all of the, like, the ways that the, some of these passages bother me, but um, it, it definitely helps that I can look at Jesus and uh, I feel like, you know, if, if the God revealed in Jesus, if that is God, then I can believe that this God is good even despite some of the the more difficult things in the Old Testament. I really appreciate your honesty on this. I think it gives permission to a lot of people who say, I can still have faith. I can still have a reasonable faith. I'm not quite sure what to do with these passages, but here's how I make sense of it. I think that's an honest, authentic response, and I'm sure you'll keep thinking about this and wrestling with it and maybe settle a little bit differently in the future. But I think that honesty is great and gives people a lot of permission to wrestle with these passages and not maybe have to accept an explanation for them that they just simply don't find convincing. So with that said, you're a believer now. Uh, Do you have persistent doubts? What do you do with doubt? Like you talk a lot about certainty in the book, which I appreciate because when I talk with a lot of people who leave their faith Mm. Over and over again, they'll talk about how I just wasn't certain anymore. I literally was talking with with somebody the other day who's like, are you certain Jesus rose from the grave? And I said, no. And he about lost his mind. And I said, well, I'm confident, yeah, right. but I'm not certain. So maybe talk about why you emphasize that so much in your book and how you make sense of not being certain, but being confident in your faith. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, so I've had a few seasons in my life um, that I, I detail in the book of um just like really terrible like crippling doubt Mm. fear anxiety that my faith just wasn't true Mm. and um and you know for when the first time it happened i I kind of had this mindset that like man if if i'm not sure then then that that means like if i'm doubting this way then that just means i'm like not a christian anymore so and I would like to be a, continue to be a Christian. So I kind of just like have to like really like force myself to believe this and like mm-hmm. really convince myself. Um, and I found kind of that the harder I worked, kind of the more, just the more like fear I felt and the more doubt I felt. And what I can say looking back now is that, that those seasons, um, although they maybe played out in my head and, and they 
I, I perceived them as intellectual doubt. What was really going on was just some sort of mental health issue that I was hmm. going through times of really crippling anxiety, um, maybe maybe OCD, but just like there were deeper things going on than just the, the head level stuff. And, and so that's kind of the first thing that I think um, I'd say to people, who anyone who's in that camp is that you should consider whether maybe what you're calling intellectual doubt is actually just a mental health issue. And maybe you need treatment rather than answers right now. Um, and I think too, another thing that um, played a big role in being able to to deal with those times um, was coming to to a newfound appreciation of of what faith that the the, the faith that the Bible is calling us to is. Um, there's a book that I reference in my book called um, "Salvation by Allegiance Alone" uh, by Matthew Bates and. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a scholarly book, so it gets a little bit dense at times, but I think the the title kind of says, gives you the, the main thesis, which is that the type of faith that the New Testament is really calling us to is is not so much an intellectual belief, but it's mm. really an, it's a commitment. It's an allegiance to mm. Jesus as the king. Um, because, I mean, as, as the book of James says, right, even the demons believe, even even the demons believe intellectually that there's a God, but it doesn't lead them to submit to him. It doesn't lead them to give God their allegiance. And that was something that was also a big deal in those moments of doubt was, um, was coming to realize like, you know what, I can have these intellectual doubts um, and these fears and these anxieties. And even if, you know, one day it feels like I'm certain and the next day it feels like I'm, I'm very uncertain. The key really is that I, continue to give my allegiance to God, that I take the side of God against the doubts, hmm. uh, because that's really what God is calling me to, not not necessarily, you know, like intellectual belief, never doubting, never believe, you hmm. know, never questioning, but rather just this commitment to follow him, e- even in the midst of those. And that's something that hmm. I think has really yeah, tr- just kind of changed the way that I that I see doubt and the way that I approach it. I suspect you're like me and like a lot of academics that our minds are always operating. We're always questioning things. I have friends who seem to have the gift of faith. A buddy lost his job. He's like, God is going to come through. And I'm like, how do you know? Like, give me evidence. And he just <laughs> yeah. believes. Right, and right, sometimes yeah. I, I envy that faith. But then it hit me. I was like, you know what? I've put together 700 page books and 300 page dissertations because I'm bothered by the questions. <laughs> That's a kind of gift as much as a burden as doubt can be. Yeah. And so when I look at it that way in my own life, it reframes it. And I realize passages like Jude that talk about, you know, have mercy on those who doubt because doubt's not the opposite of belief. You can believe something and have doubts. Unbelief is, but it can be painful. And I appreciate that you talk about that in your book as you walk through uh, your own journey. You're very honest about that. I think it's going to speak to people. Now, I've got a buddy who is a magician, and we had uh, maybe two or three years ago, we went out for coffee and he goes, Sean, what are the best arguments for the resurrection? I want to weave them into my presentation. And I said, well, I'm happy to tell you what I think are the best, but I want to know what you think are the best because you're trained in seeing the world through this lens of magic that I don't know how to see the world through that way. So what you should ask is, what's most compelling to you? Use those arguments, not Mm. mine. The reason I'm framing it that way is I'm curious, you bring to these questions a certain scientific mindset with some of the top training in the world. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the resurrection, are there any facts or pieces of evidence that most speak to you that convince you the resurrection is true? Um, I mean, I think for the resurrection in particular, what, what really strikes me is that, I, I mean, I just feel like it's really a very cumulative case. Um, I think it's okay. hard to, to like s- distill like one or two points. Um, because yeah, I mean, I think it, it almost doesn't do justice to it. Um, because there's so many, there's so many lines of evidence. I think there's so many pieces of data. Um, I mean, there, a few of them, I think, I mean, I think the, the, evidence for the empty tomb is compelling. I think that the um, evidence for the appearances of Jesus is com- is compelling. And um, I think that, uh, I guess I think, I think especially the, um, the conversions of Paul and James are um, 
hmm. are pretty compelling because you don't you don't often see a lot of skeptics uh conv- like convinced by miracle uh, miracle uh, by like mm. the occurrence of miracles right um so yeah but i think you know i i've always i've given some talks on the evidence for the resurrection i've okay. always have so much trouble in like condensing it to less than uh, that's fair like an hour I think I think one other thing that I should mention too, I think it's really important to when looking at the like the evidence for the res- resurrection to to also start with like the evidence for the miracles of Jesus for who he was mm. for what his message was because I think when we when we like kind of look at all of Jesus and all of his life and all of his ministry that in light of that the resurrection kind of just fits that story very perfectly. Um, hmm. and it makes sense in the light of the larger context of, of his whole life. Is that how science works sometimes? It's a cumulative case that adds up to the best explanation for a certain phenomena, or is this a little different than how you reason in physics? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's definitely the case. I mean, I tend to think of things whenever possible from like a Bayesian perspective of, we have some probabilities and that probability is going to be updated in light of new evidence. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the ways that that works is that you just have one like really, really compelling argument that completely, you know, changes your worldview. But a lot of times, and, and that's something that in my field of like string theory, where uh, like in a, bi- a famous thing in string theory is, is these different dualities between different types of string theory. And in large part, the cases for those, it's like, well, you can do this one calculation that suggests that this is true, and then you can do another calculation here. And over time, this uh, the evidence for this duality is built up by a number of different arguments. And yeah, I think that's that same is true for the case of the resurrection. Hmm. That that that's super helpful. Let's keep going. I got some. I have so many questions for you, but we'll we'll keep diving yeah. in. You describe after leaving Harvard, so you had become a Christian at this point. You receive an invitation for postdoc work at Princeton. Then you hit a low spot in your life. What happened? How did you deal with it? And how did your faith play a role in that process? Yeah, so that was one of these times that I mentioned of just like really crippling Mm. doubt and anxiety. And I'm not sure what kind of brought it on. I guess the only thing I can uh, speculate is that I had this this goal that I was working for for a long time to get this postdoc job, mm. and uh, all of a sudden I, I got it, and um, and then all of a sudden it was like, well, what do I do now? My my life sort of lack, lacked direction for at least a time, and I really started kind of like just chewing on those doubt the doubts again, um, mm. and somehow it just quickly led me to this uh, just really rough time of of doubt and fear and anxiety. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's something that was um, I, I really came to appreciate from that season um, was just the importance of having like Christian community around me. Um, mm. That I, I think it's been important for me in those times of doubt to kind of have like the that like Gandalf figure who can walk with me mm. in an intellectual lo- level. But I think it's also important to have those sorts of people who can walk with me at more of like a spiritual and, and personal level. People who, hmm. you know, I'm maybe not going to spend uh, an hour like discussing the finer details of the evidence for the resurrection with, but the sort of people who can just like be there and be comforting and uh, and just hmm. like remind me that, that God is good and that he has a plan in this. And so that was something that was really important for me in, in making it through that time was hmm. um, just like having a community of Christian friends around me who, um, who could just be there and, and help me through that time. Love the Gandalf reference. Now you're dating yourself yeah. to the early 2000s. <laughs> Had yeah. you said Mr. Miyagi, you would have been speaking my language from the 80s, <laughs> but I digress. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in your take on, we could do entire shows on this, but mm-hmm. you study string theory and give it you particle physics and then quantum what? Tell us exactly what you study without losing those of us who don't really understand the nuances of it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I study like string theory, cosmology, quantum field theory. Um, do you want like, do you want like okay. a, a deeper dive into what those things are? 
you know what? So that's that's great. The reason I, w- I wanted you to say it because I was going to mess up the terms for him. I understand string theory, uh-huh. particle physics. But as I read your bio, I'm thinking, oh, he's going to weigh into things like the cosmological argument and give us his sense on it. But you really didn't go there. Do you? What do you think about the cosmological argument? Because that seems to intersect so closely with your research. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I'd say that there are different versions of the cosmological argument. Totally. Um, I think the one that that I and it seems like from my from my very unscientific like discussions with other Christians within my field, um, the argument that we all seem to find pretty compelling is the contingency argument. Oh, um, interesting. The, the question of like, why is there, I mean, why, why is there something rather than nothing? And why this particular something as opposed to some other hmm. something? I, I think that uh, theism offers at least as compelling of an answer to those questions as any other worldview. Um, mm. And in fact, you know, I, I don't know, it's, to, to me, as I look at it, I think theism, maybe I'm not, maybe not like completely sold on theism's answer to that question. But I'm definitely not sold on naturalism's answer. Like I think that okay. it's really hard for me to believe that just things exist for no reason. And it's also hard for me to believe that this universe could be the thing that exists necessarily. Because um, I can imagine lots of other universes out there. Uh, and I don't know why this universe is opposed to one of you know, the zillions of others that I, can, that I deal with on like a daily basis. So the, so the contingency argument is more philosophical than it is scientific. The Kalam cosmological argument deals with yeah. the beginning of the universe. What's right. your take on that since it seems to, as far as I understand, really intersect with some of your research? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I can give you, I can tell you like what I think as a scientist, and then I can tell you where uh, I kind of get lost in the philosophy of that one. Okay. So, so the first uh, so first of all, like scientifically, what we can say about the beginning of the universe is like you go back in time. So if you go forward in time, the universe is expanding. If you go back in time, the universe is contracting. And as you get closer and closer to the Big Bang, like all of the stuff in the universe that we can see beca- gets into uh, like an arbitrarily small space. Now, the problem is that when you get back to that uh, that period of time, uh, the the universe, I mean, the temperature of the universe gets so high that like the known laws of physics break down. Uh, and this is where string theory comes in because what, what happens is that like just ordinary, ordinary classical gravity stops working. And so you need a theory of quantum gravity and string theory is the best candidate we have for that. So at some point, like string theory is gonna kick in. And the issue is that we really just don't understand string theory uh, well enough to, to, t- to know what is the, like wh- how, how to describe that process. So for us, I mean, it's kind of like there's just like this wall of ignorance where you go back in time mm. far enough, you just get to a point where where everything we can see is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and at some point it's just so small that we don't really know what's going on. Um, mm. So some people, some people, you know, have speculated like, oh, maybe there's another phase of the universe where where there's kind of this like cyclic model where the universe like becomes large again. To me, that seems uh, it's possible, but it's not the most likely because, I mean, you, you know, you get to imagine you get to like a wall of ignorance. Like, what are the odds that what's beyond that wall of ignorance is just exactly like what you you just hmm. like came from, right? Hmm. Um, seems less likely to me, but also but possible. Um, the thing is, though, I mean, with the Kalam cosmo- ar- cosmological arguments, you know, it's it's that the universe has a beginning, everything that begins to exist has a cause and then you can argue you argue that that cause is god i think that the thing is um where i kind of run into issue an issue with this is that uh it seems like there's questions about philosophy of time that are coming in and Mm. i'm not sure if i really understand philosophy of time at all um but i especially don't understand it when it comes to like this quantum gravity regime where like even the notion of time is probably going to break down uh, and have to be re- replaced with something else. So is that is that like good enough for the Kalam cosmological argument to work? Maybe. Um, I feel like that's then that's where it's really getting up beyond my expertise as a physicist, and into the like the like philosophers of time need to step in. Um, but to me, I guess I, I just tend to kind of get a little bit confused there, and hmm. 
And I guess with the contingency argument, I still am kind of confused, but somehow it, it feels like, I, I don't know. It, it seems like I can get my, my, I can like wrap my head around it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah, with the Klam cosmological argument, my conclusion is as a physicist is that I just don't know. Like uh, I can tell you what okay. physics can tell you. And then from there, like philosophers need to step in and, and do the rest. Yeah. Fair enough. Last question on this one. How confident are you from the scientific evidence alone, theology and the philosophical arguments aside, that the universe had a beginning? Uh, like, okay, so yeah, put like theology away. Like, yep. I, I would say that, uh, I would say it's maybe, I, I'd probably say like 90% confident that the universe mm -hmm. has had a finite amount of, of, t of proper time. Uh, okay. So I think I think that's what by beginning would mean, uh, and that's I, I, I'd say ninety percent. Good, yeah. great answer. I'm more like eighty eight. No, I'm just kidding. I'm messing with you. Um, <laughs> that that's super interesting. Uh, we could have a whole conversation on that, but I appreciate you weighing in. Now you described this book by Scott McKnight that really rocked your understanding of the gospel, and this was after becoming a Christian. What was yeah. that significant shift for you? And by the way, for those who might not know, Scott McKnight is just a brilliant New Testament evangelical scholar. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so the book is called One Life. Um, and in it, he really unpacks the, the meaning of the kingdom of God. Like Jesus, mm. you know, Jesus, when he, he said, uh, you know, he, he came to proclaim the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. That was like his main message. It was a thing he talked about all the time. And yet... Um, it was something that at least to me, I, I just really hadn't really heard anyone do like a, a deep dive into what, what exactly was this kingdom of God that Jesus was talking about mm. and why does it matter to me? And I think that where this, um, where the, the book really kind of changed, changed me, um, it, it was in the midst of this time that I was just, that we were just talking about, um, like after, after getting this postdoc offer from, uh, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and I had just moved there. I was still struggling with this doubt and the fear and the anxiety, and um, and reading the book really opened my eyes to just the bigness of the gospel. Like when I when I came to faith, you know, um, it was this moment of feeling like I need forgiveness, and and hey, the gospel offered me that. Right, the gospel is that God has has died to to forgive me. Um, but I think something that I've come to appreciate and especially through Scott's book, is just that the gospel is even bigger and better than that. That like the gospel kind mm. of offers us good news no matter what sort of no matter what sort of problem we find ourselves facing. And uh, you know, for my twin brother, right, when he came to faith, it wasn't kind of this felt need of of I need forgiveness. It, it, that wasn't the sense. It was more, you know, like I'm going to die someday, and mm. what's going to happen to me after I die? And yeah. and the gospel met him there, right? The gospel is good news that there is eternal life that's possible in Jesus' mm. name. And and I think too, for me, in that t t period of like of of anxiety, um, that reading Scott's book just opened my eyes to to the ways that the gospel is is for me too, right? That the gospel mm. meets those fears as well. And, um, and that God just, yeah, God cares about not just my future afterlife, but also just who I am here today. Hmm. Um, and he cares about the whole world and all of the problems in it as well. Um, so I feel like I, I feel like I can't completely do justice to this book. Or, oh, that's or fine. The kingdom of yeah. God in general. But I think it just really opened my eyes, yeah, to just how, how great the gospel is. So you've written this book called Chasing Proof, Finding Faith. You've done work at all these different Ivy League schools, but you don't have tenure at a university. And presumably, correct me if I'm wrong, that's something you would want to do in a research position. So I think you must not be too afraid speaking out about your faith and publishing this being held against you in the academic world. So first off, in the world of like physics and science in the Ivy League, first off, am I right in how I'm reading that? And second, how do people respond when they know your faith? Like, give us an insight into the Ivy League world yeah. and how a lot of physicists and scientists think about faith and how they think about you. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, this is a question that I get asked so often. Hmm. And uh, and I've always felt like I never really just ha never really had a good answer for it. Um, so when I was writing this book, I have a chapter kind of 
giving my answer. And I realized that the reason why I just don't have a good answer is because there is like no one size fits all answer. Like okay. I've had, I've, you know, I've, I've experienced a little bit of the, like I've, I've been at, um, invited to speak at, at conferences and seminars and stuff. And, and sometimes people will start making fun of religion, you know, without mm. knowing about my religious <laughs> leanings. Uh, so that happens. Um, okay. But I've also, you know, I've had a, a number of colleagues who kind of just seem like they don't want to touch the subject at all. Um, I've had mm. a lot of colleagues who have, who have uh, like expressed admiration for my religious faith, um, mm. even ones who don't necessarily share my Christian faith. Um, so I feel like, yeah, the response, like when people find out I'm, I'm Christian, I'm religious, the response has been pretty much all over. But um, more often than not, it's been respectful. And I, I think that- I love that. Yeah, I think I think too that um, hmm. you know within my field, um, even at the top, there's a fair diversity of um, people from different backgrounds, different religious faiths, and I think that there's kind of this sense that um, you know someone can disagree with what I believe religiously, but they can still respect the work that I do as a scientist, and vice versa. Hmm. And, and so I think that um, yeah, so far at least so far as far as I can tell. Um, being outspoken about my faith is never something that's like hurt my career in any way. And um, yeah. And I think I'm mainly just, you know, thankful to a lot of my colleagues and the people I've worked with who, who again, maybe don't share my religious faith, but um, that we kind of are, are like bound together by our pursuit for truth uh, mm -hmm. in science and that that um, it's more important to them. So. I love that. It's great to hear. You had a comment like if someone's Hindu or Muslim or atheist, if you do good work in physics, you're welcome in the club, which told me one thing. I'm not welcome in the club because I'm not going to do that <laughs> level of string theory physics, and I'm okay with that. That's not my lane, but we have to be careful as Christians. There's sometimes for concern in some Christians who it has cost them speaking up for their faith. But to be reminded by your experience is really, really helpful as well. Now, I'm going to ask you a somewhat dangerous question. You can answer this however you sure. want to. But I'm sure looking back on uh, your experience with your brother, Steve, there might be some areas you're like, Steve, you did this great. And other areas you're like, well, maybe you're a little bit over the top here. Because when somebody comes to faith, they're just excited and they want to tell the whole world. So I'm partly asking this for Christians who are in conversations with non-Christians, how do we better navigate these conversations? So as much as you're comfortable sharing, how would you debrief that conversation that started maybe 13, 14 years ago with your brother yeah. that led 18 months later becoming a believer? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, as I look back, um, I'm really thankful just, yeah, to, the for, to, to my brother Steve for all the conversations we had. Uh, some of them did get kind of like hostile and, and heated. Mm. And I, I think what was really key for me, um, and I even, I have some, some little stories about this in my book, uh, about when I, coming to, you know, explore Christianity um, and ultimately coming to faith, it, was, it wasn't so much like the arguments that Steve made. Um, like I remember a time that of um, like, where we had, we got into this like pretty intense argument about whether or not people are mostly good. Uh, mm. And, and I wasn't very convinced by what he said. And honestly, I'm still not very convinced by what he said. Like, <laughs> I, I don't think his argument was very good. Um, but, uh, but the thing that always was really pushing me was really just his, his love for me um, mm. and, and my love for him. And I think that that was something that was really important uh, as I was on this, like, quest for truth is um is feeling like no matter what steve loved me um and that he was that he was going to be there for me like whether or not i came to believe what he believed and, and so i think that yeah that like for me i think that a lot of the the intellectual journey took place from like reading the books that he had given me uh letter, letters from a skeptic by Gregory and Edward Boyd was a big one. Great book, yeah. The, the New Testament, um, uh, like it was, it was reading, it was learning that I was doing alone was was a lot of the intellectual journey. But the thing, the impetus for that intellectual journey was like my relationship with Steve and the and the love that we had for each other. Mm. 
And so I think that, that that's maybe there's probably like a, a larger lesson to be to be learned there. Um, something that was interesting that Steve just told me re, like in the last couple of years as I was re- writing this book and I was asking him about that time. He said that uh, when, you know, when, when our summer ended, you know, we'd gone to church for the summer together. We, I'd started reading some of these books. He said that when we, when summer ended and we, and we went off our separate ways to our different colleges, he kind of felt like I just wasn't really that interested. Like I wasn't mm. really, like I just didn't really care that much about all this Christianity stuff. And it's interesting because for me, I was actually very interested, you know, I was Mm. like very much like I'd kind of been like captivated, but he couldn't tell that, you know? Um, And I guess that, I think that's kind of a lesson too. And and maybe just like the persistence that Steve thought that his, all that he was doing, you know, his conversations and all of this wasn't really going anywhere that I just wasn't that interested. Um, But there was a lot going on with, within me that he just couldn't see Um, Mm. and probably didn't see just from the, you know, from conversations, but it was, again, it was like that heart level, heart level changes that were starting to happen, um, where I was becoming more receptive. I, I love the idea that love kind of wed the two of you together. There's that passage in the Bible that talks about love covers a multitude of sins. So in spiritual conversations in a life, there's going to be missteps. I mean, my goodness, I apologize to my wife this morning for a comment yesterday. I'm like, sorry, she knows that I love her. And it's the same in these kind of spiritual conversations. So that principle is awesome. You know, at some point, uh, maybe I could have you back on with your brother and we could walk mm. through some of the conversations you had, the agreement, the, the, the disagreement, and really give people some practical steps of here's why I didn't buy this argument. Here's why I didn't respond as I should. I think there's some real lessons that can be learned in these conversations, especially with family. So maybe down the road, we'll we'll follow yeah. up and we'll we'll have that conversation I think would be really fun. Now, last question. Yeah. My father was a skeptic trying to disprove Christianity, ended up becoming a believer. What a lot of people don't know is when he wrote evidence that demands a verdict, this was for Christians, not for non-Christians. More Than a Carpenter was a short book you could read in two hours that synthesized that. That's an evangelistic book. Mm-hmm. Who is your book primarily for? Is it to strengthen Christians? Is it primarily an evangelistic book? How do you want people to use your book? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I would necessarily put it, push it one camp or the other. Okay, I think that the you know the first half or maybe two thirds uh, of my book is like my journey to faith, and the rest of that the rest of it is like my journey of faith, which includes these times of really serious like doubt and anxiety. And I think my hope is that that anyone who's reading the book will be able to situate themselves somewhere along the journey um, hmm. that, you know, may, maybe for the skeptic out there, they'll, you know, resonate with me in like chapter two. And uh, maybe for the person who's, you know, been a Christian the whole life, they'll resonate with me in like chapter 38 or something. Right. Um, but my hope is that, yeah, is the kind of that everyone will be able to just see themselves somewhere in, in this journey and hopefully be able to, find some sort of uh, guidance along the path. You know, it is written in a way you're just sharing your story. You're not preaching at people. So it's not threatening to a non-believer. It's interesting. I, I did, to be honest with you, when I first read it, I'm like, here's an Ivy League trained scientist. I don't know how readable this book is going to be. Mm-hmm. I was pleasantly surprised <laughs> at like the stories and the narrative that you told. It's really engrossing. I think non-Christians would be challenged by it, but never felt like they're being preached at. And I think Christians would be strengthened and encouraged along the way as well. So I think it is a rare book that could be used for both. Well, we definitely got to have you back. I want to make sure people pick up your copy, a copy of your book called Chasing Proof, Finding Faith by Tyndale Publishers, whom I love, by the way. And uh, before you uh, before you leave, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other interviews coming on, including those like Stephen Meyer to respond to the top objections to fine tuning in this lane and a whole host of other apologetic worldview conversations. Make sure you hit subscribe so you can track. We're going to have Tom back for sure. You did an awesome job. If you thought about studying apologetics as distance, think about joining us at Biola. We have the top rated master's program. It can be done 100% from distance. Information is below. And I teach whole classes, Tom, on the resurrection. We didn't even get into your thoughts of the problem of evil. We'll do that for another time. I do a class on the problem of evil. 
Uh, so if you're watching this and have just thought about it, join us. Or if you're not ready for a master's, we have a certificate program, and we will walk you through some of the issues today, and uh, there's a significant discount below. So thanks all for watching. Tom, don't disappear. I want to chat briefly when we're done, but really appreciate you coming on and just wish you the best in your ministry life and in your book as well. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I appreciate it. And one last thing I want to just mention because we didn't have Please. a chance to get into it. Uh, we, you asked about the Kalam cosmological argument. Uh, and that one I'm a little bit um, confused about. I think the fine-tuned argu argument, though, is actually a very good argument. Okay. Uh, and I think most most Christian physicists and my theistic physicists would say the same thing. I have a series of blog posts on that, too, for anyone oh. who's interested. Okay, uh, what's your blog? Tell us really fast so they can follow you. Ver Veritas Christo et Ecclesiae. It's the, the old motto of Harvard, uh, meaning truth for Christ in the church. And, uh, yeah, I have a whole series on there. Um, I'm sure you have other good references as well, but um, just wanted to briefly mention that one. Love it. That's fantastic. We'll have you back and we'll unpack these in even some more depth down the line. So thanks for coming on. That sounds fun. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Sean. Appreciate it.